Okay. As you can see, I'm sweating out the toxins. We're gonna continue moving forward. We're gonna go through here. You can only imagine what it'd be like if an initiation process took here for the initiates to humble themselves and get on their hands and knees and have to crawl through. I mean, Jeremy Needler's done extensive work on, on linking the Set Festival to the pyramids and initiation rites, but there's something more that could have been happening here. This place is deeply mysterious. It's amazing. I haven't seen anything like this in me Egypt. Too. So yeah, me too. I'm going to take you guys with me. Take you there with me. That is exactly what I'm about to do as we go inside the Bent Pyramid. Because the story of the Bent Pyramid is a curious case, one that I believe requires more attention. There is something deeply mysterious about the Bent Pyramid. The impression one receives here is unlike any other, and its unusual shape has inspired intrigue down through the ages. Today, it is one of the least visited, less explored, and lacking in a thorough investigation. The official story given by the Egyptologists is that the Bent Pyramid is the result of structural instability. In other words, it was a mistake. A mistake by the master builders of the ancient Egyptian civilization. As if some novices did not know what they were doing and miscalculated during construction, resulting in a horrific accident requiring a course correction in their trajectory. But when viewed through an esoteric lens, this pyramid begins to reveal its hidden aspects, implying the intent of its ancient architects for a deliberate design from the onset. Proponents of the simplest school of thought, including myself, see it as not a mistake, but a deliberate exercise in geometry and proportion, expressing the relationship of universal principles through the secrets of sacred geometry. We are of the opinion that it is not a mistake but a reflection of perfection, symbolizing the dual principle of the Hermetic Doctrine. Further, we are told by the Egyptologists that the pyramids were built as tombs. However, if it can be demonstrated that not only the Bent Pyramid, but the entire pyramidal complex was indeed intimately connected with the initiatic rites of the said festival, then this enduring idea that pyramids were built purely as tombs would have to be reconsidered. So let's take a closer look. My name is NEXT, this is the Adept Expeditions YouTube channel, and if you are anything like me and you feel a calling to research ancient civilizations and have a deep desire for exploring esoteric mysteries, then you will love what I have in store for this channel. So please take a moment now hit the subscribe button, and be sure to also hit the bell icon. By doing so, you will not only stay on the cutting edge with updates, but also help support the growth of this channel, enabling me to continue making videos like this one. In this video, we'll discuss the Bent Pyramid's history and mysteries, taking a closer look inside and out. I will be taking you inside the Bent Pyramid step by step, to examine the evidence that has led to the currently cherished paradigm in Egyptology. In this way, you can determine for yourself if the official story is indeed a fact or merely an unproven theory. In the alchemical tradition, vitriol is a Latin acronym meaning visit the interior of the earth and through purification one may find the hidden stone. In a sense, that is what we're going to do, go inside the pyramid's recently opened interior to develop an untainted, pure picture of the stones concealed within. Just as the inner work of the alchemist is never finished, there is more work to be done inside the Bent Pyramid. I was first introduced to the Bent Pyramid by my mentor, the late, great John Anthony West, who I studied under in Egypt, but at that time, we were only allowed to examine the exterior, as the interior did not open until 2019, one year after my mentor's passing. He never had the opportunity to go inside, so in keeping with tradition of the dual pyramid, we are about to embark on a dual agenda, not only investigating the structure, but by realizing Jah's dream of going inside, honoring and commemorating his life's work by taking the signature pith helmet of John Anthony West with us into the depths of the Bent Pyramid. So stick with me as we go inside the Bent Pyramid of Dashor, but not without first introducing you to someone. What's up everybody, it's NEXT. I have Sahila with me. I'd like to introduce Sahila if you're not already familiar with her. 
This was John Anthony West's official Egyptian-born Egyptology tour guide for decades. You understand? Hold on. For decades, every single one of John's trips, Sahila was part of it. She understands the symbolist approach of Ari Shual de Lubitsch. She's one of the top tour guides here in Egypt. John worked with her time after time. She was on every tour. We absolutely love Sahila. And today, today it's a very special mission. Why? Because we have John Anthony West's signature pith helmet here that he left with Sahila. And we're going to take it where? To Dahshur. To, to inside the Ben Pyramid, the recently opened Ben Pyramid. This has been a lifelong dream for Sahila and John. John, who never had the opportunity to go inside the Ben Pyramid because they just recently opened it, what, just a couple of months ago, right? I've never been inside. This is going to be my first opportunity going inside. And so this is our way of what, Sahila? What are we doing here? Of taking John with us and making one of his dreams come true. And we will definitely pursue what he wanted and what he aimed for his thinking and ideas and historic Egypt and we talk to him and we tell him about the new findings and, and excavations he's with us and he will be always remembered and loved and his books are filling the world and people love him here he is for you guys that have been following me for a while you know, a large part of my inspiration is because of John Anthony West. What I do today is because of John Anthony West. He's, what, what he's been able to facilitate and transmit has affected me. It's deeply affected me and many, many others. He's touched and warmed the hearts of many. And today, we're gonna be able to help realize that dream and bring Ja with us into the Bent Pyramid. There's the Pith Helmet, everybody. Dashua, Bent Pyramid, Adept Expeditions, adeptexpeditions.com. John Anthony West. Long live the serpent in the sky. Long live the esoteric tradition. R.A. Shuala de Lubitz. John Anthony West. <laughs>。Located some 30 kilometers south of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Dashur is home to the brick pyramids of Senwasret III and Amenemhat II and probably III. Behind these three brick pyramids, rising in the open desert, are two astonishing stone pyramids, both in excellent state of preservation, each exhibiting many interesting and rather unique features. The northernmost red pyramid, which we can now see to our left, has a base almost as large as the Great Pyramid at Giza, but not quite as high. And about three kilometers behind that, marking the southernmost boundary of the Dashur Plateau, stands one of the most impressive monuments left by the kings of the Old Kingdom, the so-called Northern Bent Pyramid. The site of Dashur is part of a military area. The base is currently obscured by these trucks to our right. Most typical spectator tours will squeeze Dashur in at the very end of the day's itinerary, leaving you very little time to adequately explore the pyramid's exterior, often rushing you back to the bus, leaving you no time to explore the interior, which was recently opened for the very first time in more than 50 years. I was among the first to film inside, only weeks after the official reopening, and since, i filmed and documented the Bent Pyramid's interior on several occasions. Hey everybody, what's up? It's NEXT. We're here inside the Bent Pyramid. And since the reopening, I've led a number of groups inside the Bent Pyramid as part of my Esoteric Egypt tours. And we plan to return in 2021 for the Lost Technologies and Symbolism tour with my colleague Christopher Dunn where I'll be working to identify, document, measure, and catalog the mysterious circular depressions discovered inside the Bent Pyramid. This will be a part of our tour that you can join at adeptexpeditions.com. But a word of caution, this is not your typical spectator tour. This is an intensive study trip that will study the evidence of high technologies and symbolism of ancient Egypt. If general tour guides even say anything at all about the Bent Pyramid, they typically repeat the usual story. That is, what is believed to be true in Egyptology, that the Bent Pyramid was probably first planned from the outset to be a true pyramid with smooth sides, not the bent shape you see today, 
but errors in planning, subsidence, and structural instability caused the builders to cost correct their trajectory first from 60 degrees, then to 54 degrees, before abruptly switching to a 43 degree angle toward the top, giving the pyramid its unusual shape and modern name, the Bent Pyramid. But how can the Egyptologists be so sure of this narrative? Could they be ignoring evidence that runs counter to their theory? The academic literature on this structure is scarce, but like all pursuits for truth, when seeking answers, we should go within. But before we go boots to the ground, inside the structure, it would be helpful if I offered you a brief history of exploration. For centuries, the unusual shape of the Bent Pyramid has attracted explorers. A pioneer in Egyptian studies, Ahmed Kamal was the first native Egyptian Egyptologist. He compiled the writings of Arab historians and discovered at least eight accounts mentioning Dashur as an important place for finding treasure. These Arab legends and lore kept treasure hunters enthralled seeking more, but the pyramid was not properly examined until 1839 when the British engineer Jean Che Pering began operations with the financial support of his benefactor, Major General Richard William Howard Weiss. You may remember these two explorers from my last video, which I am honored to say earned a 5-star review in opusmagnum.org, made the top 20 of 2020 at megalithicmarvels.com, and received high praise from the Ancient Architects YouTube channel, who said, Thanks to the outstanding new video from NEXT titled The Sphinx Explained Origins, Identity and Hidden Entrances, which, I'll say again, is arguably the best unbiased investigation into the Sphinx on YouTube. I will leave a link to my Sphinx Explained documentary in the description below, so if you haven't already watched it, you can do so after this video. If you have watched it, you may recall how these two used gunpowder to blow a hole in the back of the Sphinx, now dubbed Pering's Hole. After Weiss left for England in 1837, Pering continued operations. He was the first to explore the internal rooms of the pyramid, penetrating both the upper passage and the chamber. It was on September 8, 1839, when John Pering began his investigations at Dashur, first working on the Red Pyramid, then known to the locals as the Rounded Pyramid. But in less than a month, Pering entered the Bent Pyramid and began clearing the debris and large stones from its northern corridor. He was the first to make a detailed description of the pyramid's exterior and interior, drawing plans of each section. He referred to the Bent Pyramid as Haram Meseni, a corruption of its local name, El Haram El Masinin, meaning the Pointed Pyramid. It was also known to the locals as Haram El Watawit, the Bats Pyramid, and Haram El Sicila the Chain Pyramid, because a chain was said to have stretched between chambers. Pering published his findings along with Weiss, going down in history as the beginning of modern exploration of the Bent Pyramid. Four years had come to pass, when in 1843, Carl Richard Lepsis surveyed Dashur to catalog the Bent Pyramid, which he had called the Nix Pyramid. Almost half a century passed before the Bent Pyramid was investigated by English Egyptologist Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, who surveyed the pyramid's exterior. Debris blocking the descending passage of the northern entrance prevented Petrie from providing further details inside the Bent Pyramid. His limited findings were included in his A Season in Egypt 1887, published in 1888. In 1925, Swiss Egyptologist Gustave Louis Jacquois began to clear the debris from the Bent Pyramid of Senefru that prevented Petrie from penetrating its inner chambers. This work was finished some 20 years later by Alexander Varil, Abdel Salem Hussein, and Ahmed Fakhri. There were no major excavations until after World War II had ended. At that time, the French Egyptologist and symbolist Alexander Varil continued clearing the debris inside the pyramid, where Senefru's name was found on a block inside the upper chamber, in addition to the cornerstones outside the pyramid. Quarry marks were also identified. We will come back to Alexander Varil as it relates to the symbolist interpretation of the Bent Pyramid later on in this video. Eminent Egyptologists 
Abdel Salem Hussein began work inside the Bent Pyramid in 1946 and continued for three more seasons. Unfortunately, his valuable notes and all but a few photographs went missing after his untimely death in 1949. In 1951, Egyptologist Ahmed Fakhri took over the project, stating, and I quote, When the time came to take over the work, all his notes during four years of work had completely disappeared, and all my efforts to find them had failed. I had to depend on only the memory of some of his former assistants or workmen for information, end quote. Some of Hussein's photos were recovered and published in newspaper articles and journals, but it is likely that there are more. So it could be a worthwhile endeavor for some bright, enthusiastic researcher to come along and work on tracking down these lost documents. It's not for me, but if someone out there took this on and it was successful, I believe it would certainly be a major contribution to the field of Egyptology, as data on the Bent Pyramid to date has been scarce. In Fakhri's report, he admits, The interior of this pyramid has been examined, but I can never pretend that it has been thoroughly investigated, or it does not need more researches in the future. It was the work of Pering that remained a primary source in Egyptology up until this time. However, in 1962, we finally receive a more detailed description of the structure when the Italian architects Vito Maragioglio and Celeste Rinaldi surveyed the Bent Pyramid, resulting in the publication of a multi-volume set. Three years after the survey, in 1965, the Bent Pyramid was closed to visitors. Over 30 years had come to pass before Andrew Bayok became the first to publish color photographs taken during his 1997 private excursion inside the Bent Pyramid. You can find the photos on his website at guardians.net, to which I'll leave a link for you in the comments below. In 2001, Charles Regano entered the Bent Pyramid interior and published an article in the journal The Ostracon. Then, in 2012, the Aceta Project further documented the interior. In 2017, my colleague and fellow researcher, Andras Sabo and the Research Center Laboratory of Alternative History were granted access to film inside the Bent Pyramid. But it wasn't until 2019 that the Bent Pyramid was officially reopened for the first time in more than 50 years. I was among the first to document and film its interior only weeks after the official reopening. Hey everybody, what's up? It's NEXT. We're here inside the Bent Pyramid. And since then, I've led a number of groups inside the pyramid as part of my esoteric symbolist tours of Egypt that you can join at adeptexpeditions.com. And I filmed inside each time. Now, I'm not going to pretend, like some YouTubers, that this is never before seen footage, because this was almost two years ago. And a significant number of YouTubers have uploaded footage from the pyramid's interior since, many of whom have filmed after me. But what I'm going to share with you is unique, because it's not only my first experience inside, where I'll take you through the entire pyramid step by step, so you can see what I see as I'm seeing it for the very first time, but also because I'll be showing you never before seen footage of sections inside the pyramid that have never been documented here on YouTube until now. Not only will you see inside the excavated cavity where the so-called builder Senefru's cartouche was discovered, but also you will go up the now sealed off passage for a remarkable, rare glimpse outside the western entrance. And if that wasn't already enough, what makes this Adept Expedition so unique is that you'll be taking part in a special mission. You see, I was first introduced to the Bent Pyramid by my mentor, the late great John Anthony West, who I studied under in Egypt. But at that time, we could only examine the Bent Pyramid's exterior as it was still closed to the public. It was always a dream of my mentor to go inside, but he never had that opportunity as it didn't reopen until one year after his transition into the afterlife. So, to honor and commemorate his life's work, and to help realize that dream, we bring along John Anthony West's signature pith helmet into the depths. And you'll be joining us for this special mission as we go inside the Bent Pyramid at Dashor. But first, let's have a brief look at the exterior. Upon arrival, we can see the foundation of its first cornerstones. 
We can also see significant damage to the northwest corner, but overall, for one of the oldest pyramids, it is well preserved. If the monument was a serpent, it would be in the process of shedding its skin, as most of the casing stones are still intact. What caused the damage is unclear. Some scholars think locals destroyed the pyramid to repurpose its materials, while others think it's more likely to be an earthquake. In any event, the construction techniques represent an evolution in pyramid building. The pyramid is also unique in that it has two entrances, one to the west and one to the north, made accessible by modern stairs. There is more to the exterior that I cover on my tours, but for the sake of brevity, let's head over to the northern entrance and go inside. After climbing up the modern wooden staircase, we arrive at the north entrance, where you are now standing on a platform some 12 meters above ground. The very first thing I'd like to call your attention to, which often gets overlooked or missed by the casual tourist, is this enormous megalithic lintel above the steel door entrance. Here's a photo I've included for scale. We can see Sahila emerging from the entrance, holding John Anthony West's signature pith helmet just under the lintel, which measures 3.18 by 1.5 meters. To put this into perspective, this is a single stone measuring 10 and a half by nearly five feet, lifted up some 40 feet from the ground and placed precisely into position. Its depth was not recorded in the pyramid's official survey and remains unknown to date. Notice the unusual rectangular notches at each side, likely left from the ancient masons who built this structure. The notch in the right or western side appears to be more damaged. Let's take a closer look. We can see here, in this detail, close up, what a complete marvel in engineering this pyramid truly is with joints so tight you couldn't fit a credit card between them even if you tried. The, the joint runs along the top of the entrance. Moving along, we can see a close-up of the rectangular notch in the stone's eastern side. Just inside the pyramid, above the steel doors, and cut out of this lintel block, is the cutaway that Petrie mentions. It is about 8 centimeters or 3 inches higher than the plane of the passage roof and slopes down to rejoin the ceiling plane. As you can see here, Petrie thought it may have held a door, but I'm not so certain. Let us now go inside to further investigate the pyramid together. Here's a tip. This is a good one to learn. Upon entering the passage, it's natural to want to face forward, but what you really want to do is turn around and climb in backwards as if you are climbing down a ladder. It may feel awkward or counterintuitive, but take it from experience. Like a Mandalorian, this is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. As we turn around, from this view, you are now looking up towards the entrance, facing north. Here, you can see the vertical joints of the single blocks that make up the walls of this passage. Below the continuous joint, they revert back to two courses. From the outside, we are given the impression that the single blocks are two courses, as you can see here. This may have been to trick looters seeking to violate the pyramid, and this use of single blocks becomes a recurring theme in later pyramids. Back inside, you are now about 10 meters or 30 feet from the entrance. This is our first major point of interest, so I'm going to freeze the frame here for you, because again, most general tourists pass right by this. And to date, I have not come across any other video on YouTube exploring inside the Bent Pyramid that actually stops to document this section, typically passing right by it without any explanation of its significance. However, it is important to discuss because this is the area of the so-called settlement that Egyptologists use as evidence to suggest structural instability and subsidence. As you turn to your right, a view of the excavated east wall showing the face of the continuous joint comes into view. What you are looking at is essentially two separate pyramids. That's right, we have the original unfinished pyramid to our right, which is thought to be the first true pyramid with smooth sides and a sloping angle of 60 degrees. And to the left is the enclosure built around it, which began at an angle of 54 degrees before abruptly switching to 43 degrees, giving us the unusual bent shape of the pyramid. 
As we now pan to our left, you have a view into the excavated west wall, showing the face of the continuous joint on this side. Also in the view is the dressing on the roof that is mentioned in Petrie's work. These faces have an angle of approximately 60 degrees, and the continuous joint runs around the wall, ceiling, and floor. A similar continuous joint displaying a lesser angle of 55 to 58.5 degrees is located in the western corridor. In this corridor, there is no so-called settlement at this joint. So, in order to explain the continuous joints, the Italian architects Vito Maragioglio and Celeste Rinaldi, working in the 1960s, rotated the western corridor to align with the plane of the north corridor, and they noticed a line connecting the two continuous joints displayed at an angle of approximately 60 degrees. And such a line, if continued to the pyramid's base, would display a base of approximately 300 cubits. And so, this is what has led Egyptologists to believe that the pyramid was originally intended to be 60 degrees. But a series of construction defects somehow went without consideration from the master builders, resulting in a significant change of plans, giving us the bent shape that we see today. Keith Hamilton provides a different theory to explain these anomalies in his remarkable paper, The Bent Pyramid, The Curious Case of the 60 Degree Pyramid, to which I'll leave a link for you to review in the description below. Hamilton also believes that it was not a 60 degree pyramid, but rather a stepped structure. He believes that what we are seeing may be joints that have been made perpendicular to the slope of the passage, as seen here in this image taken from his paper. This idea of a step structure concealed within is not all that unusual, as we have found evidence of step structures hidden under smooth pyramids elsewhere in the Old Kingdom. In some cases, they are incomplete. Others, they are destroyed. But in every case, they provide us an intimate view into the superstructure. For example, we can clearly see the step structure of the Queen's Pyramid adjacent to the Menkare Pyramid at Giza. But let's get back inside the Bent Pyramid to continue our descent through the narrow tunnel, which measures some 79 meters or 259 feet. For comparison, that's almost the size of a football field. What's up, everybody? This is NEXT. We are in the middle of our adept expedition, making way down into the infamous Bent Pyramid, the depths as we plunge down. We got our faithful group of adept initiates behind us. Steve's leading the way. The so-called settlement at the continuous joint is accepted by Egyptologists as evidence of structural failure and subsidence. Though, Hamilton accepts Petrie's view, who said, and I quote, This shows that the builders were well aware of this formation in their time, and yet that they did not wish to smooth it all out as if it were an accident or settlement though nothing would have been easier for them than to have removed all trace of it, this part, like the rest of the pyramid, needs for more examination." End quote. My feeling echoes that of Petrie and Hamilton, as after some 130 years, we are still awaiting more examination. When we look at the Italian architect's survey of this area, we find that it is insufficient. They have left out the different construction methods of the upper corridor from the continuous joint. They provide scant information on the form and size of blocks in this area, and the illustrations for this area fail to show masonry lines. It's not that they were not capable of providing this data, as they have for surveys in other structures. For example, with the Khafra Pyramid, they provide roof block dimensions, yet this information is missing in their survey of the Bent Pyramid. Hamilton feels that they may have taken their eye off the ball, an all-too-human failing, having found what they believe is a major discovery and concentrated on working on points to support it, disregarding points that run counter to their theory. It really is an unlikely event that the whole upper corridor conveniently pivoted around the entrance. Therefore, I am of the same opinion as Hamilton. I lean toward the idea that the upper part of the corridor was purposely designed this way. But you decide for yourself. Again, I will refer you to Keith Hamilton's paper for your own research. Let us continue on. So 
I'm now walking down little backwards. A little more room vertically down here. A little more. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just to give you a sense of our way to the top, this is everyone coming down. You're, you've made it to the bottom? There's light at the end of the tunnel, everyone. I can see it. <laughs> Well, it really is. You're, we're going back into the womb, into the earth. Yeah. And when you're down in the, the darkness, the sensory deprivation, and then you would come out into the light, it's like a rebirth. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. It seems like a feminine pyramid. Yeah. 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 I see stairs leading back up. At the bottom of the long, narrow, descending passage, you emerge into an antechamber. Look at how the floors cut away, here in this rendering, facing west. This is where we just came from, descending from the northern passage, and the stairs that we are about to ascend would be here. You can see here how there is a pit below that we believe is worthy of further investigation. But you can't see it, or wouldn't even know it's there, because as we see here, it is now covered over by these wooden planks. This antechamber is odd. It feels like a continuation of the descending passage. The width is the same as the corridor at two cubits, but with a huge ceiling, soaring to a height of 41 feet. The width is closed at the top by corbeling on the east and west walls, with a total of five corbels employed in the construction. The end of the corridor meets the modern wooden stairs that provides access to the lower chamber, which we are about to soon enter. These same stairs prevent us from seeing a clear view of the south wall of the antechamber, which is a vertical face of rock, and as Keith Hamilton points out, it may have been tiled. At the base of this rock wall, an excavation has been carried out, possibly by violators, up to two meters in length. In this photo, taken before the current, more secure steps were installed, we can see some of the southern rock wall of the antechamber. Look here at the east wall left of the stairs. Could this be natural rock or missing tiling? You can see how the walls are well preserved right. as they were protected by a stone staircase. Oops. Now let's head up into the lower chamber. <sighs> I'm winded, I'm spending far too much time on Facebook. <laughs> From the northeast corner, you enter into the lower chamber, or what the Egyptologists call the burial chamber. But for now, we'll stick to calling it the lower chamber, as no human remains have ever been found inside. At this point, you have made it further than Petrie ever has, as during his day, debris prevented the famous Egyptologist from penetrating this far into the pyramid limiting his survey to only part of the descending passage, in addition to the Bent Pyramid's exterior. The east wall, to your left, is well preserved, but we can see traces of red plaster on the walls, as seen elsewhere in Egypt. The rock floor of the chamber is some 51 feet below the pyramid's base. The top of the rock floor was fitted with pavement, adding 35 more centimeters of thickness. The height of this chamber is 33 cubits, or 56 feet from the paved floor. The numbers 5 and 6 will become important later in this video when we examine the pyramid's exterior. Straight ahead, another portal opens opposite the entrance of the south wall, leading to a shaft called the chimney. The entrance is just under 13 feet in height, from the floor to the large lintel. We can see blocks of rubble restricting access. Imagine this entire chamber filled up with this kind of rubble. That is what it would have looked like in the 1940s before the rubble was removed by eminent Egyptologist Abdel Salam Hussein and Alexander Baril. As we enter the chamber, notice the stone facing on the southern wall, just right of the entrance. It looks like tiling. 
I had no idea what to expect my first time, so I went straight for this area to look beyond the pile of stones. Look at this. What do we have in here? Covered up by all this debris is a deep vertical shaft on the floor that goes down into the bedrock. A slab of bedrock and paving stones were placed on top of it in a clever attempt to conceal it. In the 1940s, Egyptologists excavated at least 25 feet of the way down, but never reached the bottom, and no one knows how far down it actually goes. Beyond the shaft is the chimney, with a total height of 15.27 meters, or about 50 feet. This part of the bent pyramid is perhaps the most mysterious, as the function of the chimney is not clear, even though some scholars believe it was a planned route to reach a burial chamber. Other scholars, such as John Romer, believe it was used during construction to shelter a plumb line at the center as the chimney is aligned directly underneath the vertical axis of the pyramid. The top of the chimney ends at a level close to the pyramid's base, but a modern survey is required to confirm this. Its role remains unknown, but the fact that it's attached to the lower chamber would hint at it being intricately linked to it, inferring that both chambers and passages were carefully planned from the outset. Even the Italian architects who surveyed the Bent Pyramid in the 1960s admit this intention, contradicting their own work, and I quote, Therefore, in this pyramid the two apartments were planned from the very beginning, even if we cannot understand why, end quote. This is Steve, everyone. This is Steve of Steve's Crack fame. He discovered Steve's Crack on the Giza Plateau. Greetings to all. I will tell you, it's arduous, but really worth it. And I'm the old guy in the group, but I made it. If I can make it, you can make it. <laughs> Where's the rest of the crew? Everyone, there I'm must be still. For you. You're doing good, this looks like it used to be. This is interesting. It looks like the corbel arch here. Yes. But it looks like it's. Is it deteriorated? Yeah, I'd like to wait for a still high rise, actually. There's these, there's these chambers that go off each side. Yeah. Look at the cut of that one. And then this in itself, these rungs here, let me go up. So now I'm gonna climb the stairs. So I just wanna bring everybody along for the journey with us in the Bend Pyramid. I've got Sahilo trailing in the back. She's carrying Jaws, signature pith helmet. These unusual circular depressions are a real mystery. They were likely meant to hold wooden beams into place, as we've seen in the corbel arches below, but what their purpose was, we can't be certain. I plan to begin documenting, measuring, and cataloging each of these depressions during our next expedition to Egypt, which you can join. This will be part of the Lost Technologies and Symbolism Tour of Egypt that I will be co-leading with my colleague, master craftsman and engineer Christopher Dunn. If you'd like to be part of this adventure, you can join us by registering at adeptexpeditions.com. This trip is already filling up, but at the time of this recording, we do have a few spaces left. So be sure to get on our email list for updates and discounts at adeptexpeditions.com. Okay, we have some really big stone. Here's these circular. This has been used Oh, so this is what we got next. I'm gonna have to crawl through this. This is the winding passage which we will enter next. This is where we are in the upper part of the lower chamber 
we'll make our way through the passage that was cut into the pre-existing masonry, connecting the lower chamber to the horizontal chamber. From here, you'll have the option to either go left or right. We will first take a right toward the entrance to inspect the western portcullis, then turn around and walk toward the east, past the eastern portcullis, up a flight of stairs, and into the upper chamber on top of the massif. squats for six well, weeks. I should have been doing squats. <laughs> I have two. But I didn't know six weeks ago I was going to be doing anything I like worked this. with two. We're live on Facebook, girls. everyone. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Kelly. What do you think and of the event here, Mr. Hey, so far. It's beautiful. Look at, look at this. How it's spectacular it's this chamber. It's beautiful. Wow. And it's... Wow. And it's not bloody hot. <laughs> no, it's great. What would you advise for anyone watching this video who hasn't been here yet that's thinking about coming? Well, I'm going to say I'm 65, out of shape with bad knees so far. Doing good. Me too. I'm 62, out of shape also with bad knees. And a bad back. I'm okay. <laughs> so do it, folks. And so there's what we've got coming up. Yeah. So we're going to go through here. Okay. So, Hila, are you coming? Yes, yes. Are you filming? Yes. I'm filming. Say hi to Facebook. Say hi to YouTube. <laughs> are you are you going to pass it over or are you going to come? I'll take it if you need it. Okay. Okay, yeah. oh, Look at her. There, there she is. is. There she is. Woo! There it John is. Is making it. You're going to pass the bag, right? Not just yes, the hat. Yes. Okay. Maybe oh. put the bag. Oh, no, no, she can't. You pass can't. it. It's, it's more yeah, but I thought you were going to put it back in the yeah, bag. Yeah, I know, but maybe it's easier yeah. for him to put it in the oh. bag, yeah? Next, how do you want to do it? The bag. Give me the bag so we don't damage it. Right. That's what I think. Yeah. Hey. What I think is. I bet he's enjoying this. This is for you, Ja. Yeah. Who's that? What? Yes. Uh, four. Five. 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 Maybe outside. <laughs> There's more. There's more coming. Uh, this is hooked in my head. Can someone unhook it? Okay. Oh, really wrapped around your leg. There we go. And then just. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Swing it to my yeah, back. Yeah, now it's the crawling. Okay. okay. Don't smash it on yeah. the back. I Hold just this put for it a minute. Hold that. Yes. Okay. Put it in the front now. As you can so. see, I'm sweating out the toxins. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue moving forward. <laughs> We're going to go through here. You can only imagine what it would be like if an initiation process took here for the initiates to humble themselves and get on their hands and knees and have to crawl through. I mean, Jeremy Nadler's done extensive work on, on linking the set festival to the pyramids and initiation rites. Okay, we've already seen this spot, so allow me to provide some appropriate context. The Bent Pyramid is located within what's called a pyramidal complex, which includes a valley temple some ways to the northeast, a chapel to the east, and a smaller auxiliary or satellite pyramid, often called a Queen's Pyramid, to the south. While the presence of a Queen's Pyramid may lead us to believe that the Bent Pyramid is a tomb for the king, there are several important aspects that we should be taking into consideration. First of all, as we have already mentioned, no sarcophagus has ever been discovered inside the Bent Pyramid, in either of the pyramid's chambers, not even a trace let alone any human remains. But to be fair, this of course does not constitute definitive evidence that the pyramid was not used as a tomb, but nor does it provide any evidence that it was. Second, the adjacent chapel is comparable in scale to the one at Midum, which as Egyptologist Mark Lehner has demonstrated in his work, entitled The Complete Pyramids, is best viewed as a cenotaph rather than an actual tomb. So it is likely that the Eastern Shrine is a monument to someone buried elsewhere. And third, 
Two stelae were erected along the east side of the satellite pyramid. Uninscribed fragments of one stela were found, but the other was discovered inscribed, thus giving us context for both. We know from Ahmed Fakhri's 1959 work entitled The Monuments of Senefru at Dashur, Volume 1, The Bent Pyramid, that it is almost certain that the two stela placed in the chapel adjacent to the Bent Pyramid and the two stela placed at the entrance to the Valley Temple were all identical. Thus, it is likely that each stela, surmounted by a Horus Falcon, held the same inscription as the one discovered by the satellite pyramid. Therefore, all six stelae serve to link the pyramidal complex together. On the stela, we can see Seneferu's name in the cartouche and royal titles. The hieroglyphs read from top to bottom say, Lord of Truth, King of Upper and Lower Egypt. Nesu Biti, the B meaning one of the B, a symbol attributed to the kingdom of Lower Egypt, the North, and the Sedge, a symbol of Upper Egypt, the South. In effect, it's a dual royal title, where the obvious unification of the two lands, North and South, are represented, in addition to the reconciliation of the divine and the mortal. From the symbolist point of view, the bee with its wings represents that which can transcend the earth, a symbol of transformation, order, and immortality, attributed to the unseen spiritual realm, and the sedge, organic vegetation, that of the earth, attributed to the material world. Next, it says, the two ladies, a euphemism for Wajit, depicted as a cobra, and Nekbet, the vulture. Taken as a whole, these two principles represent the same unification of the two lands, as well as the unification of that which is above with that which is below. Then, again, it says, Lord of Truth, and concludes with Horus of Gold, we see the symbol for Horus, surmounting Nebu, the hieroglyph for gold. So one more time, all together, it reads, Lord of Truth, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, the two ladies, Lord of Truth, Horus of Gold. Alongside this, we see a depiction of the king. This is particularly interesting for our investigation, as we can see him seated on the said festival throne. He wears the short tunic of the said festival. The said festival is a controversial subject in itself that I'll be covering in a future video that will aim to go more in depth. From an Egyptological point of view, the purpose of the said festival was to test the aging king, proving that he was still physically fit to rule after a 30 year reign. However, when viewed through an esoteric lens, the central rite of the said festival is understood as the king's harmonization of the sacred and profane. That is to say, where the unseen world converges with that which we can see. A mystical experience transcending time and space, reconciling form with the formless for the benefit of the two lands collectively known to us as Egypt. In other words, it was an event in which the king entered into a shamanic state to commune with the cosmic in order to access hidden spiritual powers, in effect perpetuating prosperity and fertility throughout the land. As Jeremy Nadler has pointed out in his scholarly work, this is not the only evidence linking the Bent Pyramid to the said festival initiation rites. The Bent Pyramid was the first pyramid to ever have a valley temple located in its proximity and linked to it by a causeway. In addition to being the first of its kind, the valley temple of the Bent Pyramid features some astonishing reliefs. At the north end of the central hall, one can find the remains of 10 pillars that most certainly featured the king performing the initiatic rites of the said festival. Here, we can see the position of the king's elbow and foot along with the bull's tail of the said festival kilt, three carns, and two half sky glyphs, enabling this remarkable reconstruction by Jeremy Nadler. Given the position of these attributes, there can be no doubt that this is the dedication of the field, an important rite of the said festival. And when we look at all of the evidence, it becomes crystal clear that not only the Bent Pyramid, but the entire complex at Dashur was not purely built as a tomb, for it was at least in part oriented toward the initiatic rites of the said festival. And so, the theory commonly accepted as fact that the pyramids were built purely as tombs is in dire need of a reappraisal. Let us carry on. 
It's amazing. I haven't seen anything like this in Egypt. So yeah, me too. I'm gonna take you guys with me. Next, put it in, in here because yeah. in the back it will smash. Okay. Fine. It's a pith helmet. It's meant to smash. No. So I wouldn't worry no, about it. John wouldn't it's not gonna smash because I'm gonna I'm gonna go low. I have it. Yeah. It's okay. not gonna smash. Okay. Oh my god. Upon entering the passage, we first began by crawling, but soon realized how that was unnecessary, as there's just enough of height for one to stand on two feet, hunched over. You know what? You don't have to do hands and knees if you don't want to. Yeah, just bend over a lot. Just bend over and put your hands on your knees. Yeah, probably. Is everybody else coming? Yeah. Right behind you. Well, the rest of the crew? I don't know. Do we need headlamps now? Uh, so this passage was cut into the masonry. It's thought that the laborers had used this passage yes. to exit the pyramid after the western portcullis was let down, blocking the western entrance because they found plaster on both sides. We'll see the western portcullis in a moment. We can take. We're gonna come back down. So. Well, okay. Yeah, I did it. All right. Okay, we got a fork in the road. Right? What does this say? It says discovered. October. October. 18. 20. 18 something. 35. Just want to make a quick correction here. The date is actually October 20th, 1839, referring to the date John Shea Pering discovered the western entrance. Pering began his operations on September 29th, 1839, removing stone blocks and debris from the northern corridor and chambers to reach the interior. So it's likely he didn't reach this point until a month later, on the 20th of October, 1839. Let's just investigate this. Oh my gosh. Behind this modern wooden gate is a corbel space that housed the now lowered portcullis. This is a real life Indiana Jones trap here. A portcullis is a giant stone gate intended to slide down to plug the corridor, preventing access inside the pyramid from the western entrance and mortar was applied to keep it sealed. Egyptologist Ahmed Fakhri tells us, the portcullis was sealed with mortar around the edges on both sides, indicating that the north and west entrances were opened when the portcullis was lowered, end quote. This is the only portcullis that has been lowered, as the eastern portcullis is still in position. And because they found mortar on both sides, they were able to determine that whoever lowered the portcullis exited through the winding passage to the lower chamber and out through the northern corridor. Herring states, The portcullis must have been let down when both of the entrance passages were open, as it had been plastered on both sides. End quote. Fakhri tells us, The portcullis was plastered on both sides, which proves that the laborers who did this were able to leave the pyramid through the winding passage and the northern entrance. End quote. Beyond this is the western entrance, where in 1947, just a few feet inside, a small wooden box containing a mummified bat, bones, and owl were found under a stone in the floor. However, this mummified bat is not from the time of the pyramid's construction, but believed to be from a much later period, where animal mummification became widespread, as I explained during my live talk at the CPAC conference. In the Ptolemaic period of Egypt, animal mummifications became so widespread that the animal farms started to become depleted. In fact, some of the priests got together and decided that, like Egyptian art, an image alone would suffice. So sometimes they would just use a single bone and mummify it. And spiritual pilgrims would come and pay for a donation to make a donation to the temple to Tobi. You can find the full version of this live presentation entitled The Esoteric Wisdom and Sacred Science of the Ancient Maya Mystery Schools here on my YouTube channel. What's also interesting is that a crudely drawn lion and some 26 dynasty texts were also found just a few feet inside the northern corridor. It's possible that the western portcullis was let down during this period, 
but it is also thought to be broken by violators in ancient times. As you can see the damage here in this upper north corner. Egyptologists working under the direction of Abdel Salem Hussein in the 1940s cut into the stone, enlarging the passage to provide easier access. This portcullis was designed to slide down from north to south, whereas the eastern portcullis, which is still in place, is intended to slide from south to north. The horizontal corridor runs some 65 feet and 6 inches, connecting the western entrance to the upper chamber. And there's another passage here that's blocked. This must go to the other entrance. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what the guy in the room Within the corridor are the two portcullis and a vertical shaft, which we'll take a look at on the way back. Let's move forward. So basic. Okay. I would not want to be inside the upper chamber on the day that this portcullis finally falls into place. Good work. <laughs> now take a look at this here on the left, on the northern wall. This opening often goes overlooked. I am yet to come across any videos on YouTube exploring inside the bent pyramid that have covered this section. But stick around, because on the way back down, I'll be taking the camera inside so you can get a closer look, as well as going back to the western portcullis where we're going to go beyond the wooden gate that we just took a look at and we're going to go all the way up to the western entrance so that you can get the full experience. So be sure to stick around to the end of the video. Teamwork makes the dream work. Although, you know, if I'd done the red pyramid, that would be harder. <laughs> I gotta hand it to you, Steve. You did both, the red pyramid and now this one. Yeah. The same day. I know. <sighs> back I, to back, you might say. Oh, man. I don't know if Daddy is gonna make it or not. Is that bad guano? That's the top of the, the pyramid right there. So just to be clear, this is not the top of the pyramid. This is just the upper chamber. What we are looking at is the damaged corbel ceiling where the bats are inside the upper chamber. We are above ground, but this isn't even the uppermost part of the pyramid. We are now climbing up onto the massif. Yeah, I'm gonna wait until they come. Is this it? This is it. Look at this, there's another room right here. Oh, those this are the pit. timbers they wrote about. Oh. Okay. Well, there is, and on, on the other side, there's, there is another entrance to this pyramid. I think that's what they have blocked off. I need to see the diagram. Here, we find the remnants of upper beams running east to west that appear to be cut or broken off. Just above them are two circular depressions. We can also see these wooden beams under the corbel. The walls of the chamber appear to have been channeled inward to support the vertical beams which rest inside each channel, and there's a gap between the corbel and beams filled with mortar. In the northeast corner, we see a horizontal beam against a vertical beam. How it is fixed is not known and remains a mystery. Keith Hamilton suggests that it could have been banged into place to create an interface fit. We can also see the remnants of two floor levels. Why and when the floors were raised, not once, but twice, is also a mystery. Some scholars believe this may have led to the coral damage. Yeah. Ah. This upper chamber is incredibly difficult to describe without actually seeing it. So watching this video can be helpful to get some answers, but still it raises more questions. Is that true or not true? Do I know? Entrance where you see to the left underneath? In the in the middle? To the far? To the far outside. Do you see that? It looks like an opening. No, that's the wood. It looks like a wooden column, right? Ned, how old are those timbers? Look at that. Yeah. They're just vegas. <laughs> so what do we have? We have one, one two, three. And then there's three below, still in place. Then we six, seven, eight, nine. Three into the wall, nine total. And then there's two on top that broke. You have this one and this one. See that there? Oh. Yeah, that looks like it's it. Not too bad. 
definitely worth doing. This is unlike anything Looking else. up here, we can see extensive damage to the surviving corbels at the top, which make up the and ceiling. And we have wood up here, too. I wonder if these are like Where the cedars of Lebanon. They must be. Oh, the, they the branches, they, yeah. Oh, they are. They have to be oh, here. Yeah. We don't know. We don't yeah. know for certain, but yeah. it's a good possibility because it, it was a venerated... It was venerated to get that. They didn't have... They didn't have... Well, it depends when this thing was actually... Maybe. So my research has confirmed that my suspicion was correct, and these are indeed the cedars of Lebanon. I had to dig deep for this, but it turns out that Seneferu sent a fleet of 40 seafaring boats to the shores of Lebanon, which came back filled with cedar wood. I even came across an account of Seneferu using the cedars of Lebanon to build more boats, and for making doors to a royal palace. Egyptologist Ahmed Fakhri says, and I quote, There is no doubt cedar logs, which still exist in the interior of the bent, were part of the cedar that came from the 13th year when work was still in progress on this pyramid. End quote. You may have noticed how I was counting the logs. This is because ancient Egyptians often employed number symbolism into their structures. From a symbolist point of view, the cedars of Lebanon were a symbol of nobility and longevity. This is because the wood of the cedar is tough and durable, making the tree a symbol of incorruptibility in addition to purity. This is interesting considering the color of the stone, white, also being a symbol of purity, as well as its attribution to the white crown of the south, Upper Egypt, juxtaposed against the red crown of the north, Lower Egypt, just as the northern stone pyramid at Dashoa is also called the Red Pyramid. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Cedarwood is described as being the dwelling place of the gods, and the timber was used in the construction of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Just like all evergreens, cedar is emblematic of immortality. In addition, it was also considered a symbol of rebirth for the ancient Egyptians, who also used its oil as a sweet-smelling antiseptic in the embalming process. We are here... I'll wait for Sahila before I pull the hat out of the bag. Sahila? Is anybody behind you? Or are they falling off? They fall, all fell off. They fell off. That's okay. We made it. Oh, We're going to honor and commemorate Jah. Ja. Mm -hmm. well, Jennifer was with John in, uh, with in 2006. Six, yes. Mm. Once you know John, forever John. <laughs> and here is Barbara. Who never met John. I read one of his books. After I signed up to come, and I learned a lot. And this is uh, next, of course, the very wonderful student. Hey, we should all take a moment no of silence. Yes. special approach and made it simple for many different levels of education or mentalities to, to, to digest and understand. And he made sense and he fill, filled in the gaps that did not make sense before, you know, with other explanations. Look at this, the wood. Mm -hmm. It's so old. It's an effort stand. Of course, of, of course, nobody can bring, bring this kind of timber and insert and, 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 and do this. This is a mystery to me. What do you think about it next? <laughs> it's a deep mystery. I have. I have to understand. I, this, I wish we were able to d drop down. You see, see them? This is what I'm talking this, about. Yeah, like that would from be here, hard. This I, I can climb down there. I believe. <laughs> no, I could from here. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. But it's interesting but because there's that hole right there in the middle is what you're talking about. Well, it's right? not a hole. There is a well, split between there's a split. The, the, the rocks. Right. Look at how they are arranged. But huge rocks. I think this is a ceiling to something below it. Mm -hmm. And look up because if you look up, you have right. the you have the wood here too. So, Haile, you think these were maybe the cedars of Lebanon? This looks very much like 
Well, as, and I they get know. this kind of uh, hard, yeah. long-lasting, huge, uh, 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 huge well, logs like this. They were part of the construction, and they were needed here for some reason, like the organic. Right, the organic. With organic the, that's what I was going to say. The wood, and then let's give consideration to the potential for number the numbers. So this is actually a good place to do a, a quick short number wrap. If, if John would. <laughs> uh, you know, give consideration to the the uh, numbers as it applies to the cosmology. But you know so what? I I have a theory, yeah. and I might be totally wrong or maybe a little right. The the stone quality of the whole inside is white. Yes, mm. it's white, mm -hmm. and yes. and the, and the, and the placing of one next to that, there is no really space to put a paper. So very tight, right? Now, when you look up, see the seam here. All right, look up, right? Uh, we are seeing the sky. When we go back to where Richard is after after the, the, the you know the first climb, and you look up this square platform before we came here, it has also very detailed corpel uh, 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 roof to very high sky, I think this, temp this pyramid represent whether Milky Way, whether the sky, it has this feeling where mm. the red pyramid represents Earth and the megalithic Bringing stones in the, the back. Earth to sky. And it has the reddish, <laughs> the reddish feeling of uh, whether a reddish a planet or or, or or fiery planet or earth while this or one blood. this one did you feel the air this could be milk Th this is a milky to and me I to me i kept sky. thinking of childbirth like we were coming down mm -hmm. like we were going to it's the so room. pure and it is feminine yeah it while it the is. other one is so masculine it is in many ways and by the way those huge blocks here they are a ceiling right under. This is a ceiling to a chamber, and we have seen how they cover the stones, the rocks, roughly, to not let us in. But mm. this is a chamber. Yes, yeah. no, you know, no doubt I'm about just, it. I'm wondering how much of the wood is actually functional versus symbolic. And it may be both. It could be purely mm -hmm. functional or purely symbolic. And you have like the, you know, you have the one, two, three vertical, and then we have three on bottom, a second row of three horizontally, and then there's two here that are missing. And is, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there's the wall. I think the it's, three it's across, supportive. It's the walls. Besides, this is supportive and symbolic. Both. Symbolic, definitely. I, well, you can't say definitely, but the or, the organic material that's being used. And then if we do give consideration, oh, and there's actually, so mm -hmm. then you have three, like you right. pointed out, On vertical here. Side, where the, so look at them. Three this, I think this connected to that. Oh, wait, right? Three. Yes. So these are the four. Are yeah. they four or two? Is on stone. Where they connected the line? There were beams across so here at one time. The difference over actually, here, we yes. have three, there, the three. Yeah. three Upright, so, so three vertical, three vertical on this side. Look, look. It's, it's different structure. Come around, yes. stone there. Really. It's so beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Then it's rough. Then it is rough. So there was a ceiling here, by the way. Look, this looks as if there was a ground continuing that. Two verticals on the right side. And this was just in stone. Oh, see, that's strange considering the the, the, the Egyptians' affinity for symmetry. There's three on the right. There's, yeah. mm -hmm. there's three. There's three? There are two, three. No, but no, the no, vertical no. ones. The verticals. What about the vertical ones? There's one there. Yeah. It is? And then there's one I, right here. I thought it was in stone. That's why I was looking. Come here. Looking. Look. Ah. You see that? One? He's right. There's three. Yep. Oh, okay. And that makes sense because okay. the Egyptians would typically have, you know, it's like an affinity oh, for yeah. oh, symmetry. Yeah. And so you have three on every wall. Three would be symbolic of 
it would be the number for a relationship. You have the, one, the two for duality, and uh, simultaneously, it's going to create a relationship. That's three like three is a very holy... good support. It's like yeah. a tripod, too. You know, it's three. Symbolically, though, support yeah, yeah. would start with four. So John wrote oh, a yes, phenomenal right. chapter in his book entitled uh, "Pythagoras Rides Again," where he breaks down the number symbolism that's expressed, like carried on from through the Pythagorean mystery schools, and so three. One being the absolute, two, that, that would be undifferentiated consciousness. And then Ari Schwal de Lubitz refers to that split as um, the primordial scission. And that's, that's the duality, which in tandem simultaneously creates a third, which is a relationship. Four is the material, the structure or form. You have the four corners, the four cardinal directions, the four... You know, that, that creates a structure. And then from five, that's, that's new life. Five is Horus. It's the return to... So, yeah, well, the thing is, we have three on this wall, three on that wall, three on this wall. And then six here. Three, three across and, three. and then another level. Yeah. So that's I wonder, six. six. Six this way. Mm -hmm. And what? How many? Three, six, nine? So you got nine. six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And then there's... Who knows that's what's what down we, here? That's what I wanted well, to know. And then you have these here, the two that have been... Go ahead, you're going to say something, Well, Barbara? I was going to say, so the furthest top uh, board across, or log across, doesn't look like it really has a support system over here at the right. Yes. There's a separate one that comes out, and the one that comes up, and, I mean, how is it stabilized on the right-hand side. Can what you get a light stability? on that? Oh, here we go. What do you mean stability? It, 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 it may it do looks something. Like it's just pressure, it possibly, yeah. pushing it against that mm -hmm. other item. It's, because it, there is, it's not like it's It may bad, be for know? a support, it may be not. I mean... You guys let us know what you think. You've had the opportunity to look a bit inside, so leave your comments below and let us know what you think. So we can make this an ongoing effort with not just the people here, everyone, so we can kind of build and put some ideas together. And, the results so you know. good, we, I wouldn't be there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the one I pointed out before. Yes. And then there was probably more, let's see, there's it's that one. It's just like this one little support. Right. It's just, look at the way there's so much shape. It's, oh, yeah. it's like, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's like marshmallow. <laughs> it looks the, like an ice cream sundae. Yes, and that's uh, what I thought. And, uh, and, and so is this, this is going to be bad guano, right? Yeah. Bad no, I guano? think so. Yeah. Bad? Yeah. I don't think so no? because it smells no. great. It does, but and but it, this isn't, it has this a is wine. Uh, no. yeah. It's soot. It's soot, you think? Yeah. No, it's too brown. There yeah. is no... Uh, no we well, have some here. Let's see. Is this a bird? It doesn't smell like that. No, it doesn't. I, yeah, smell I don't smell it. The it's smell not like is a red great. Pyramid. There is wind. There is a nice breeze, like windy oh, and, down and, then and sweet. Is this glyphs? Is this car? No. No, no thanks. I see these so chip marks yeah, here. Yeah, like chips. And then there's some more over there. On this side? Yeah. Well, I don't know what is that. And, I, and it's not bad because it Oops. is not as Sorry, I, I don't know what I did. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Sorry, I messed it up. No, that's okay. All right. Nobody else made it up. This is it, right? No one else is coming up. Wow. Actually, why don't we all meditate and tone up here for a bit? Oh.
is last it, is, is it really the end? It's never one? the end because there's always a return to the next cycle, return to source. And, John and there did is the work, more to so. explore of this, by the way. Yeah. It's not the end of what we see. There's more I to have come. a very strong feeling about it. Come. There is, you come as you go. You work very hard to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you made it. Do you want to go before me or after or whatever? I will take my time. You know what? I really have a super feeling here. And when I'm here, I don't want to leave. I know, me either. And I, I don't go to inside every monument. This place, as much as hard as it is, hard to come and, and hard to leave. You don't want to leave. It, yeah, it feels it's very, it's, it's very nice. There's a good feeling here. Yeah, we better leave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I really can stay longer. Here again, we have some more of these circular depressions on our way down. This one is very deep, as you can see. Here is another one here. And there's four here that we can see on screen in total. Two on each wall, parallel to each other, likely to support a wooden beam, although we are not certain. We really have no idea what the purpose they served. If you have any ideas at all, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Again, I plan to start measuring these on our next trip. These blocks here on the north and south walls are well squared and laid with mortar. Did you take a photo of the other exit? Yes. Did you see it? Yes. The western door. Yes, the one that's blocked? Yes. Yes. In front of you. Look exactly at, this at the, stone. the end of the facing. Yes. Yeah, we'll go back over there on the way down. Mesh. Look at the size of this stone. This is just. Up to you. I want to stay. It's hard Yes, Sahana. Yes, Yes, it, it keeps it cold. What's this over here? The stone is cool. Is that an opening? Yes, of course. And that's what I'm saying. The, the, that under those big building. Yeah. Can you see anything? Hidden chambers. So this is. Here's a that's, that's not the end of what, what, what yeah. is open. There is more to it. And then you have this here under the stairs. Oh, yeah. <sighs> What? Here, we are facing north, below the upper chamber floor level, looking into a cavity that leads to an excavation under the massif, spanning over two meters. This excavation is a real mystery. It is believed to be the product of pyramid violators, and only extends into the massif a short distance. This is often passed over by the casual tourist. However, this is important to cover because in this excavation was found the only cartouche of Seneferu inside the pyramid. Oddly, it was painted upside down on one side of a block. This cartouche, along with Seneferu's Horus title, discovered on the northeastern cornerstone, is part of the evidence that Egyptologists use to attribute the pyramid to Seneferu. But the fact that it's upside down could suggest some sort of repurposing of the stone or maybe just a responsible replacement. Whatever the case, why this precise spot was chosen for excavation and exactly who excavated it is not known, but it is interesting to see faint traces of red lines visible nearby. Egyptologists are convinced these markings are from the time of Seneferu, but how can they be so certain? There was a revival of a Seneferu cult in later dynasties, and perhaps this graffiti was the product of one of its followers. And personally, I'm not entirely convinced in the standard story that Seneferu even built this pyramid. I think a case could be made for the Bent Pyramid being much older, predating Seneferu, who may have usurped it and even performed excavations himself. Egyptology's understanding of Seneferu and the chronology may not be entirely understood. We will come back to this later in this video when I explain the symbolist interpretation. You'll want to stick around for that. For now, let's carry on.
there is a place, your finger there is an opening to some Oops. chamber. Oh. Did you see it? No. Oh, wait, but you can. Maybe you can see it. Sweat. Yes. Uh, uh, filmed. Yeah. No, it's, I don't know if it's changed. Yes, did you see this door? <laughs> Do you see this? Yes, I, I know this on no. the left. I love the left one. Did you see? It's a one slab. Huh? One slab? What? That's too. Oh my god, that's also a, another corbel ceiling. Beautiful. Yeah, there's so how many. many? There's, how how many? many there's so many corbel ceilings in here. What do you smell? I smell, I told you, this looks like insects of bees or kinds insects. Insects, she's saying. <laughs> what, what do you yeah, think it is, that's, Steve? That's, that's well, kind it's, of it beetle. feels oily. I yeah. think it's some sort of ceremonial oil. You think but it's, it's what? Ceremonial oil. Or, or mm. I think it's, it's This beetle. doesn't look like insects. I look at the way this is dripping. Look. Is it dripping? Is it bad mm -hmm. one all over? No, the bad no. will be terribly smelling yeah, ammonia. Smell. And, and this is a very nice. This is another center. outstanding mystery inside the Bent Pyramid. We have no idea what this is, but I'd like to call your attention to it as it often goes overlooked. Not too many researchers are discussing this. Some of the candidates that we proposed are bat guano or ceremonial oil. Although I'm not certain either of the case here. I think there's also potential that maybe even something from the ground coming up absorbed through the stone. I can't say with certainty, but uh, one of my colleagues has secured a sample. We, they are doing testing. There is no data available yet, but when that becomes available, I hope to update you in a future video. Let us know what you think in the comments below if you have any ideas. No. <laughs> All right, this place is better to go on your tush now. We need to have- Wait, let's take a look over here okay, real quick. Okay, go ahead. See? This is the, this goes this leads to the western entrance, yes. right? Yes. The other yeah. entrance is in the west. Yeah. That, that's and this. that's the only pyramid, as far as we know, that has, that has the two. Entrance. The two. And so oh. that stone there looks like a like a prehistoric like reptile head. Huh? See the, that the other one here to the right there, like it has an oh, eye to and, and a mouth to it. See? Uh, well, the one on the ground? I have to know where there's is this one to the right and then there's one directly to the left. Point to it on the camera screen. Are you able to see it in here? And point here where you think of this thing? No, but it is shut. This blind shaft was discovered by the Egyptologist Abdel Salem Hussein. While removing debris, his workmen noticed plaster in the corner here, which led to the discovery of this blind shaft. Ahmed Fakhri describes the shaft, and I quote, When the blocks of the floor were removed, there was found under them a very carefully built shaft, which measures 2.65 meters by 1.46 meters, and which descended to a depth of 4 meters, approximately, and was built on the mother rock. It does not communicate with any other part of the pyramid and was filled with rough blocks of a yellowish kind of hard limestone, which was different from all the other kinds of stone used in the construction of all the other parts of the pyramid. Could the mother rock that Fakhri mentions be another deception, like the mother rock found in the southern shaft in the lower chamber we discussed earlier in the video? This is another investigation waiting to happen. Perhaps between Keith Hamilton's paper and this video, someone in Egyptology with authority to dig deeper will be inspired to further investigate not just this shaft but the entire bent pyramid which we can't emphasize enough really deserves a thorough survey this shaft is believed to be around three to four meters or 13 feet and it's made up of four courses of stone it's not showing up where we're uh, oh interesting wow i just i thought i see a face and it's open and it's open but uh, okay all right. Is it, isn't it amazing, the breeze? Yeah, it's, it's really nice. So beautiful. Yeah. So, Hilo, what did he say? What is it? He says that the guard said that there is a window. I think he meant oh, so the western breeze. opening. It's open to breeze. To bring the breeze in. But it's not accessible. So it's not to enter or you to exit. You can feel the breeze. You feel oh, that? It's, it's wind here. It's come, the wind's coming, coming from, from here. Oh, it's okay. coming from this shaft oh, over here. And it's a beautiful this wind that we mention has been a recurring theme in the historical literature. Fakhri says, On some of the windy days, there can be heard inside the pyramid 
and especially in the horizontal corridor between the two portcullae, at the end of the ramp and the western entrance, a noise which continues for almost 10 seconds. This occurred several times and the only explanation is that there is still some communication with the exterior and probably an undiscovered part of the interior of this pyramid still exists." End quote. And then we have more of these... Uh, it's so one, cool. two, three, these, four. These are solid. They're just carved in them. I wonder if they were all so that there was wood across. That's what I was thinking with the other or ones. Or it was light. To put the light. Well, I'll put the light in, that it's a light niche. Yeah. 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 But the breeze here is astounding. How many do we have? One, two, three, four, four. five. Over here, one, two, three. Here four. in the widest part of the corridor, we find five pairs of these rectangular holes. And so this, this goes out to the western entrance here. So this leads to the western entrance. But we can't go any further because of this wooden gate. But we're not going to let that stop us. We are now entering the Western Passage. Because what's a documentary inside the Bent Pyramid without footage of the Western entrance? So we are now using the footage of my colleague and fellow researcher, Andras Sabo, to give you the full experience. You can see the bats flying overhead. As you can see, there are no stairs, making it very difficult to climb up. So as you can see in this diagram here, the box with the mummified bat was discovered right about here. Oh, we got bats flying right into the lens. Now this is a rare treat, few eyes have actually seen this section of the bent pyramid. You can see the rope required to pull yourself up. We can now see Andras making his way toward the entrance. are now looking outside of the bent pyramid through the western entrance looking toward the west this is really a remarkable view the western entrance was discovered by pering in october of 1839 but it wasn't until over a hundred years later on april 5th 1951 that the very last stone was removed from the western corridor allowing full access inside here we can see the red line down the center of the ceiling this is a very important section of the pyramid 
Because as Keith Hamilton has pointed out in his paper, the problem with the account by the Italian architects, Vito Maragioglio and Celeste Rinaldi, is that their drawings do not reflect what we are seeing here. There should be a drop of about 5 centimeters in the ceiling as well as the floor, which they say is settlement, but that's not what we're seeing here at all. What's in this diagram is not what's reflected in person. As Keith Hamilton states, first, the floor of the corridor displays no settlement. It is smooth and level. And second, the wall course joints also appear level throughout this area, end quote. You can see for yourself how nothing is displaced here. The official survey indicates that the floor should display settlement. Maragioglio and Rinaldi have drawn in a step in the floor. Do you see any step in the floor here? Everything we are looking at is smooth. There is no settlement visible on the floor. Hamilton also says, and I quote, I am not denying that the cracks exist in the corridors, but they also exist in other pyramids, be it at Medum or the Red Pyramid. It's the interpretation of them that concerns me. In the Bent Pyramid, they are used to bolster the theory of settlement. In other pyramids, similar cracks and degradation processes are ignored. Are we looking at a double standard? End quote. And personally, I too think it's an important question to ask, because the entire Egyptological narrative rests upon the unproven theory of these architects. Most Egyptologists are simply echoing the work of this survey as they write the history of the Bent Pyramid into their books, and then we are led to believe that it was all a mistake, when in fact, there is a case to be made for a deliberate design from the start. Let's carry on. We did it. How do you feel about the wind here? Oh, it's a, it's a wonderful breeze. It actually it, it's, it's a cool. huge relief. Cool. It helps to cool you down. I'm sweating put, bullets. Put, that on. The, put it on. Mm. Sweating out the toxins, but the uh, you really feel this immense breeze coming in right here. And also oh. from over here, when we came near the western shot, you can feel a breeze there as well. The stonework. Smaller, but these stones are large here yeah. compared to here and there. Yeah, so I left you. Oh my oh, god, he's losing. Anyone with no? So from the top, we're going to descend down through this chamber. No, wait. Best on the tush. Oh, we got more people next, coming. I'm not sure that I'm going to push back. I have a built yeah. in fish. Yeah. No, you don't. But I do. <laughs> Can you make a rally? Yeah. Uh oh. Okay. What is the right note? You okay? Still right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, you might want to wait right there yeah. so that they can come around you and then you should see. It's it, it's that you're gonna go right up there. You're here, you made it. And then you gotta climb some steps to the top. Yeah. You came this far, you gotta to go to the end. Oh, Kimball is acting up here. Here we go. Is that common? Where? For the chambers to be curved like that? No, this is unusual. I mean, I haven't seen anything like this in terms of the pyramids. Residence chamber, you can hear the reverb. The ideal place to. Oh my God, the breeze yeah. is right here. My hair is blowing. If I had hair on, but my scarf is blowing. The breeze is so heavy. And it's coming from that chamber, of course. Okay. okay we got some stairs. 
Here's another one of those holes or divots that perhaps maybe wood the the wood would run across here. You can see the reconstruction, they're using it for the same purpose. You okay, Barbara? Oh I am. I'm definitely up here. Yes, Sahila. So, Hyla, you want me to wait here? Okay. This is... Yeah, take your time. We're in no rush. This is our last destination today. So, we have some megalithic stone slabs running across here. Yes, exactly. And once you are out, it's like rebirth. rebirth. But the wind and the smell. Oh, this, that, this pyramid is about life. It's not about death. There is life here. Oh, well, it's not death. It's almost perfect circles. The life force, the wind, the breeze, the oxygen, the, the light. Purpose has life, life in it. It's so very lively. It's there isn't anything sad here, by the way. So even though this ends up with the room, but it seems that um, I don't know. Does it look like there is a room behind? I'm not sure. Unless there is an opening under this stone. It's all room. it's all stone, and then there's is an opening. There's an opening up okay. there. Okay, that's great light from from here to top. How far? Then is there an opening under those rocks? Does it lead to a room? That's, there's an opening oh. there. It goes up and back. It goes up and back that way. This is the most unusual structure. Nothing like it. Can you see what I mean here? Look, look how many of those designs it's, it's made in different directions, like in here you see the corbel ceiling, in here then a few cup, you know, a couple of different ones on the sides. It is an emphasis to the corbel ceiling that represents the sky. The breeze coming through too, no other pyramid it's has so that. It's so peaceful, just peaceful. Yeah. The other thing is this <clears throat> this staircase, this is new, obviously, it's part of the reconstruction. This wouldn't have been here. So how, how did they, they get up there? there? And so they went up for some reason. Then <sighs> well, they, they could have used down. something like these these stones or a behind here. You know, there's a lot of dirt. And then they could have climbed there. And made which, it. which has mm. also another side. Ceiling of that quality mm. or, or design. The so, corbel arch. So it's here and here, and this this is the main one, big one. Yeah. But, but then when we went up, there are a few of them. So we have to count one of those days. How many, how, many, how many of them? How did they get that there into place? What were they standing on? It, it had, they had to build a, some you sort of ramp. see the size of this stone? Yeah, it's massive. And the quality?
This concludes our inner investigation of the Bent Pyramid. So let's now recap and discuss what we have learned from this investigation. I have already explained how the pyramids could not have been built purely as tombs, and how the entire pyramidal complex is directly linked to the initiation rites of the said festival. As a practitioner and student of the Western esoteric tradition, and with giving great respect to the ontology and cosmology of the ancients, it becomes easy to see how the pyramid could have been conceived as a primordial mound, and therefore used in ritual to carry out initiatory rites. I'm not saying that the Bent Pyramid was not used as a tomb at some point somewhere along the line, or even that it was not intended for that purpose because I don't believe we have sufficient evidence to rule that out yet. However, I don't see any evidence to arrive at that conclusion either, and I believe that it is a premature assumption in Egyptology. The fact remains, no human-sized sarcophagus, let alone any mortal remains, have ever been discovered inside this pyramid, and I believe that the counter-evidence linking the pyramid to the said festival should really be an eye-opener and a call for a reappraisal of the standard narrative. That said, it would now be worthwhile to discuss the symbolist interpretation of the Bent Pyramid. Earlier in this video, I mentioned French Egyptologist Alexander Varil. He was the first Egyptologist to develop the theory that the Bent Pyramid was not built haphazardly, but rather deliberately designed and planned from the moment that the very first cornerstone was laid. He discovered a stone in the northeast corner bearing Senefru's Horus title. Horus Neb Ma'at, exalted, Shu, in the city of the Double Jed. The ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs didn't make use of vowels, which further complicates the issue among Egyptologists, leading us to make educated guesses on what a word actually sounded like. Despite being spelled S-N-E-F-E-R-U, or in some older texts, S-N-O-F-E-R-U, Varil believed that the name Senefru may indicate the Kabbalistic possibility of the Egyptian root word Sen, too, calling our attention to the causative form of the root Nefer. This possibility appears less surprising when we consider how there was a Theban prince named Sen Nefer, represented with two hearts, one white and the other red, in the same way that the white and red crown of the north and the south are attributed to Upper and Lower Egypt, as well as the material and immaterial worlds. His famous tomb was comprised of two apartments that are clearly distinct, one placed under the other. The Ab or Ib, that is the heart in ancient Egyptian, is part of the constitution of the hieroglyph Nefer. One of the blocks of masonry that Varil found in the northeast corner of the two-sloped bent pyramid is the Horus name Jepha Ab or Jepha Ib, meaning food for the heart, which could be applied to Senefru. Varil was not only an eminent Egyptologist, but also a symbolist, who sharpened his understanding of the esoteric tradition by training under R. A. Schwaller de Lubitsch. For the symbolist Egyptologist, the Bent Pyramid is an expression of knowledge, an unspoken language written in stone. As everything about this pyramid is dual, Varil says, the pyramid was intended from the very beginning of its construction to have two slopes. Everything about it expresses duality. Two independent galleries led to two apartments. In the lower apartment, two trap doors open in the chimney of the well sealed with two slabs, and there are two sliding doors in the horizontal part of the higher gallery." End quote. Varil also points out how the pyramid was surrounded by two enclosing walls, separated by a narrow corridor. The access arrived at a door with two leaves. Not far away is a door that also has two leaves, placed at a curiously small distance behind the other, to which we cannot avoid giving a symbolic explanation. Therefore, everything is double at this monument. Varil felt it was, and I quote, stupid, unquote, for the Egyptologist to think otherwise and he wrote an essay on the importance to reconsider the accepted ideas formulated on the subject of the pyramids by earlier Egyptologists. Varil explains how the Egyptians have often affirmed that they knew the law of number. He says, and I quote, We cannot deny that they jealously kept secret this key of knowledge, unquote. 
This view is agreeable with ancient accounts, as Hippolytus informs us of how Pythagoras learned number and measure from the Egyptians, and being struck by the plausible and difficult to communicate wisdom of the Egyptian priests in a desire to emulate them, also prescribed the law of silence. This law of silence was perpetuated in the mystery schools and continues to be a tradition in modern esoteric circles and secret societies. So it is not the texts that we must look for this law of measure, but rather in the monuments themselves. Schwaller de Lubitsch takes it a step further in explaining how the Bent Pyramid is not only a play of doubles, but also an affirmation of Genesis. Thus, the Bent Pyramid is expressing a stage in cosmology, along with the Red Pyramid, which in theory geometrically becomes a headdress of the Bent Pyramid, together form one pyramid with two slopes giving us the principle of what Schwaller called bolt mathematics. In other words, it was a synthesis. So here we have two diametrically opposed camps. In one corner are those who say the Bent Pyramid's unusual shape is the result of an accident due to settlement. In the opposing corner is the symbolist school of thought, which believes that the pyramid was deliberately designed this way from the onset. Personally, I think the idea that it was an accident undermines the high wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. Further, this idea is is based on a survey by Vito Maragiolio and Celeste Rinaldi, which, as we have shown, is flawed and remains unproven to this day. And yet, it is still echoed in Egyptology as truth. Keith Hamilton places emphasis on the illusory truth effect, a popular concept in the world of psychology, where basically, a lie told enough times is eventually perceived as truth. Is that what we are experiencing in the standard narrative in Egyptology as it relates to the Bent Pyramid? Or could the rhomboidal shape be an expression of the Hermetic Doctrine, thus making the Bent Pyramid a didactic structure, encoding a hidden language expressing the dual principle? After all, geometry is the purest visible expression of number. It was from my mentor, the late great John Anthony West, whom I learned a great deal about number symbolism and how number can be used as a framework to make up the physical world of our experience. West taught us how number is key to function, principle, and process. Number is also key to the world of consciousness, which together with the physical world makes up the totality of human experience. The Roman philosopher Cicero shed some light on how we may have lost our way with number long ago. He said, by them, the Greeks, geometry was held in the very highest honor, and none were more illustrious than mathematicians. But we, the Romans, have limited the practice of this art to its usefulness in measurement and calculation. This is no doubt an interesting observation by the Roman orator. To add to all of this, ancient mysteries researcher and best-selling author, Freddie Silva, eloquently describes the Bent Pyramid as striking, hypnotic, grounding, and far from being a mistake as most archaeologists see it. In his illuminating book, The Divine Blueprint, Silva explains how this temple was strategically designed to exert a direct influence on the body while simultaneously working on the functions of the planet. He explains how this effect is due to the combination of its two geometries, the pentagon and hexagon, and reminds us that both are bound in human DNA and the earth. He calls to our attention how human DNA is constructed from alternating six-sided and five-sided crystalline bonds, making us a mirror image of our own celestial sphere. So when a trigonometric formula is applied, the pyramid's two unusual slopes reveal angles common to the hexagon and pentagon. He says, and I quote, geometry is the expression of number in space. Thus, the pentagon is to the hexagon as five is to six. And of all the planets in the solar system, only the earth incorporates this ratio, unquote. So geometrically speaking, this pentagonal hexagonal relationship inherent in the Bent Pyramid runs parallel to both planetary and human bodies and may provide, as Silva suggests, perhaps a point of fusion between them. I agree with Silva, as it is no stretch of the imagination to say that portals usually represent a gateway between that which is profane and that which is considered sacred space. As Rosicrucians of the higher degrees have long preserved in their teachings, 
Temples all over the world are usually built in cosmotelluric zones, where terrestrial forces converge with that of the cosmic, hence the reason why some spaces are considered sacred. The telluric forces present at these sacred spaces have been demonstrated in very scientific experiments conducted by the late John Burke using magnetometers. So this use of sacred geometry in the monument on sacred space lends weight to the symbolist interpretation of R.A. Schwale de Lubitsch and his two-volume Temple of Man, and the theory of symbolist Egyptologist Alexander Viril that the pyramid was deliberately designed from the onset to be an expression of the high wisdom of the ancient master builders. After reviewing all of the evidence, I echo Keith Hamilton in saying that it's hard not to agree with one of the world's finest structural engineers, Steve Burrows, who after his research into the Bent Pyramid said, and I quote, By structural analysis, this was designed like this. It hasn't failed. This is actually a great success. End quote. Personally, I follow the evidence, and this is where the evidence has led me thus far. As a symbolist and esotericist, we learn to feel toward the whole nature of things, and as a result, new understanding unfolds like a rose, as nature begins to whisper its secrets through sacred geometry. But you don't have to take my word for it. Whatever the case, it's difficult to argue with the facts that the Bent Pyramid is often overlooked, information is scant, even flawed, and yet the unproven story behind one of Egypt's most important structures continues to be told as if it were fact, when clearly it needs more investigation. But based on what you have seen here in this video, you be your own judge. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Was it a mistake, or was it intentionally built with this unusual shape in mind? I'd like to give a big shout out to Keith Hamilton for his brilliant insights and remarkable contributions on the Bent Pyramid. His academic papers and layman guides to the Bent Pyramid are a valuable resource. Both were instrumental in adding inspiration to this video, and again, I encourage you to use the link below to download his work from academia.edu and send him a message and let him know NEXT sent you. I'd also like to say thanks to Trevor Grassi from opusmagnum.org for creating the original illustrations used in this video, and of course, Freddie Silva for allowing me to use his image of the geometries inherent in the Bent Pyramid. You can learn more about his work at invisibletemple.com. Many thanks to the whole Supreme team at the Laboratory of Alternative History for creating the 3D models, and my fellow researcher and colleague, Andras Sabo, for his additional footage. Andras makes some incredible videos that have previously only been available in Russian, but have recently been translated to English. So make sure you follow him at lah.ru. And special thanks and lots of love to my Adept Expeditions crew, Sahila Hussein and Ryan Rios behind the camera on additional footage. And of course, a big, big thank you to you, the viewer. You invested nearly two hours of your time to watch this. And so I do hope you learned at least something from this video. If you like my work, please give it a thumbs up hit the subscribe button, and please click the bell icon as I have much, much more on the way. Leave a comment below with your questions and thoughts, and I'll make best efforts to try to answer them and respond. And I know this was a long one. This was at the request of members here in the YouTube community, but I do plan on starting to create shorter videos in between these longer documentaries to get my content out more frequently. You can hang out with us in the meantime in the official Adept Expeditions group on Facebook. And if you'd like to join me in Egypt, check out AdeptExpeditions.com for my forthcoming tours. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, since you stuck around and watched the whole video, I'm going to leave you with this brief bonus footage. Here's some rare footage from inside the Bent Pyramid's neighboring subsidiary, satellite, or Queen's Pyramid which may have inspired the design for the Grand Gallery in the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And to this date, I have not seen any footage inside this one on YouTube. So enjoy everyone. And please share the video to help grow this channel. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Or I should say, until any XT time. Well, what do you know? Another horrible arch. Again, huh? Amen. And there are eight. Oh, eight on each side. I'm going to see one at a time. I'm rocking it. Woo! <laughs> 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 okay.
can everybody vacation like this? You know?